<laughs> Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who've started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 16 with registered dietitian and exercise physiologist, as well as intermittent fasting expert, David Goldman. This episode was brought to you by Prana. Prana makes clothing for all kinds of adventures, from yoga to climbing, surfing, after surf, even work. We pretty much wear Prana product every day. Best of all, they're built to move with your body. So for surfing, swimsuits stay on, which is awesome. Shorts flex even when you're reaching your legs in weird climbing spots and in yoga. And dresses are constructed to go from the beach to a meeting or a date, which is great for me because I don't love changing. You can wake up, get dressed, and hit the road. Also, for those who care, Prana keeps the environment in mind when they make all their products. You can check out Prana's sustainability video series at prana.com. And right now, if you go to the website and enter the code WILDIDEAS, you'll get 20% off full-priced items. Today's guest, David Goldman, has some wild ideas when it comes to nutrition, fasting, and health. If you've ever been curious about intermittent fasting, straight water fasting, or different ways to train and eat, he's all about using fasting as well as an exclusively plant-based whole foods diet for promoting optimal health and performance. David got his master's at Columbia University in applied physiology and nutrition, as well as the registered dietitian credential. He worked at Columbia Athletics as a strength and conditioning coach, then he was a nutrition consultant at Facebook. Most recently, he's been at True North Health in Santa Rosa, California, which is a supervised water fasting center, and he manages the fitness program and also consults with others on nutrition and fitness, and he gives lectures. On the side, he's been working with some major NFL athletes as well as other professional athletes, guys from the Chargers on plant-based eating, ways to train, intermittent fasting. He's also been filming a movie due to come out. My guess is around Sundance next year in 2018. The movie has some other big names like Brendan Brazier and others in it. I'm really excited for it to come out. David eats every other day for lots of times of the year. He also does some wild experiments when it comes to how he eats, his health, his nutrition. And I really like this episode, but just so you know, it is for information purposes only. Take what you like and leave the rest when it comes to this info. If you have a health problem, consult your doctor, etc. because neither of us are doctors. This is just a guy with some wild ideas about living healthy. I hope you enjoy this show. All right. Well, today we have David Goldman here. So excited to have you, David. David is a registered dietitian researcher. He's an exercise physiologist and a strength and conditioning coach. He wears a lot of hats. And David, why I love having you is, you know, part of living wildly means you have to be healthy. And you've really dug into how to be healthy, how to eat right. Just for the audience, this is information purposes only, not medical advice, so consult a medical professional, etc. David Goldman, I'm excited to have you on Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Shelby. It's really great to be with you. Well, can you just tell the audience, people listening, kind of what you do? Because you wear a lot of hats. I know you're working with some NFL and NHL players and professional athletes. So I'll let you just give us the little elevator pitch of what you do. Sure. Yeah, I do a, a bunch of different things. Um, active in, in clinical research, looking at plant-based diets and seeing uh, the impact on health uh, on things like, well, as actually athletic performance as well. Um, I really love, I guess, I love the, the crossroads between exercise and nutrition. Mm. And so I like to apply that with my patients when I want. So I have a, a bunch of different patients. We work um, bridging the gap between between food and training and trying to optimize that for whatever their personal goal may be, whether it's managing a disease, let's say it's they have type 2 diabetes they're trying to get rid of, or let's say that they're a professional athlete trying to you know, perform their absolute best. I work with lots of people from lots of different camps, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we got to move around and we got to put things in our bodies that work. So I study this, like I said, in a research fashion, help them with publication of these uh, fantastic trials to get the information out 
to other people who could actually do something with it as well, doctors and, and other researchers, um, but then also just actually applying it. I love both learning and sharing it. So oh, that's so cool. Uh, that's kind of what I'm up to. So, so yeah. people listening know I met David because I went to this place called True North Health where he is – What's your title there, David? I know it's something really impressive. Director of Nutrition and Fitness. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, of just, uh, Nutrition and Fitness at True North Health. And I went there because I actually listened to a podcast about someone else who'd went there. And long story short, when I got back from New Zealand, my lips were starting to turn white. And I had these like white pigmented areas on my skin. I thought it was just what surfers call howly rot, which is when your skin starts turning white. The dermatologist said, no, you've got a, you've got vitiligo, which is an autoimmune condition. She told me I could use laser treatments and spend tens of thousands of dollars and that maybe it wouldn't work. Or I could use these steroid topical creams that could cause cancer. So I decided I would try something else, something dramatic, something extreme. I would do a water fast, a water only fast. I did four days and I did it at True North Health, met David, and he started talking about some amazing things. One of the things you did that I thought was really fascinating is that you were you were at Facebook. Can you just tell me a little bit about what you did as a nutritionist who helped at Facebook? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I'm actually going to go back to Facebook again this next month uh, and also to Google as well to give a couple talks on a few things, actually. One is going to be on how uh, the diet that we eat can actually influence, and I actually feel kind of bashfully to talk about this, but influencing things like sex appeal and body odor and breath and awesome. uh, skin tone and things like that. So I'm actually pretty pumped to do that and a little, uh, yeah, I guess bashful about it too. But that, things like longevity, uh, boosting brain function, uh, how diet and exercise can influence that. So basically helping their thousands of engineers to the best of my ability to uh, to follow the type of diet and exercise program that will, will help them be productive, will help them take less sick days, um, will help uh, you know, just improve cognitive health and just general well-being. Um, I helped uh, design their their fitness center, so uh, they have a pretty big fitness center, and I, I played a role in, in determining what equipment we'd have and the layout for all that. That was really fun. That sounds um, fun. Working with people one on one, yeah, it was really cool. And also, I got to work with the the kitchen staff too and help kind of figure out what sorts of foods that were being offered. You know, how could we tailor that to really optimize health and, and well being? So I did a bunch of stuff there that I really loved. Oh, and I also taught ski and snowboard uh, conditioning class and half marathon course and a bunch of fun stuff like that. It was just a really good time. That sounds like a dream job and you should have traded stock for um, <laughs> <laughs> hindsight. I love the story about the artist who right? worked for stock. So I really want to talk to you about your journey into health, but I got to ask you, I mean, this whole like plant-based diet for sex appeal and how you smell. Can you just touch <laughs> on that? That's so fascinating because I'm new to the plant-based yeah, diet. I've done it for a year and I don't have guys hitting on me left and right, but uh That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, so everything that I share is all research back. I'm only pulling these things from peer reviewed literature. I'll just give you an example. There's pretty cool data looking at two weeks of eating just a regular nasty, like high animal protein diet. And then they had a, actually had guys do this. I forgot university of Prague. I want to say did this for about two weeks and then uh, women smelled the essentially smelled pads that these guys had been wearing under their armpits uh and they rated their you know how pleasant or or not pleasant they smelled anyway they did that for two weeks then the guys switched over pulled the meat out of their diet and the way that they rated the smells of these guys was just dramatically better uh, i think it was something like 17 guys were basically sniffed by 30 women on two different occasions and they controlled for a bunch of things like you know during, where a woman is in her menstrual cycle can affect her smell so basically they just or, or her you know her how, how she smells, you know, what, mm. <laughs> not how she personally smells, but yes. her sense of smell. Yes, I, I get, get it. So anyway, they, uh, you understand. I so get it. <laughs> did this, stuff like this improves, seems to improve smell and halitosis or bad breath. There's a bunch of different things that seem to be influenced to a plant-based diet that, uh, that, that seem to work better when we have more fruits and vegetables. Well, it's funny because Johnny and I were just talking about there was some Howard Stern episode a long time ago with David Wolf, and he he said he could he could tell who was vegan and who was not in the room, and he pulled them all aside and smelled everybody's armpits and was like, "Meat eater vegan, meat eater vegan." <laughs> I want I don't know I mean I guess it was a long time ago, but it's interesting that you can you can tell. So obviously you eat plant-based. I'd love for you to talk to me a little bit more about your diet, but really, you know, how did you get into health and nutrition? It had to be important for a reason. Kind of how did your journey yeah. begin? 
Yeah, I uh, so I was five years old. My mom read to me one of those books that no one should read to a five year old about <laughs> huh. what happens in like slaughterhouses, and oh. it was terrible. I was actually eating chicken wings or chicken fingers at the time. I was eating chicken fingers at a fast food place called Friendly's in New York. My mom was eating them too, and she just thought she wanted to raise her kids to full disclosure so that we know whatever is happening, and then we can make an informed decision. Um, Great. So I was like five years old and I thought, man, that was terrible. Yeah. I thought, okay, I can't do that. So I, I went vegetarian, but not healthy. And I actually got really, really overweight during that time. Five until I was 20 years old, I was a vegetarian. Um, and then I was started to train. I started to lift. I was snowboarding. I was uh, running competitively. I was just, I was playing a lot of sports and I was really active. Um, and I really wanted to, to add muscle and I wanted to boost athletic performance. And uh, so I, I, thought I had to eat meat to do that. I mean, that's what we're told, right? That you have to eat a yep. lot of animal protein. You have to have whey protein. You have to have your, all this stuff. So I did that from 20 to 27. I ate all that stuff. And during that time, um, I went to grad school and I learned as much as I could about how nutrition, you know, the underpinnings of, of nutrition. I got my graduate degree and I realized I, on my 27th birthday, I just remember thinking, hey, I, I've learned enough at this point. I realized that I actually don't need these foods to compete and to be athletic and to be strong and capable. And so on my 27th birthday, I killed it and uh, went all plant-based. I'm 33 now, so it's been six years. But I've played with lots of different diets throughout that time. I've gone like on the uh, low-carb. I've gone low-carb ketogenic, low-carb not ketogenic. I've gone you know, I've done things like zone and South Beach and, and high protein and low protein and raw and – um, paleo before it was called paleo. So I played with all these different things. And, um, and yeah, to be honest, I mean, I just, I feel fantastic doing what I'm currently doing and my blood work has never been better. And I haven't, the funny thing is I didn't increase strength. I didn't decrease strength. I didn't improve. None of it changed depending on, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of people are very sensitive to what they're eating and how it affects their strength. I, I kind of feel numb to those things. I feel like the main things that I feel different from really is just fasting or not fasting. I can't tell if I go, you know, if I eat fast food today and I didn't tomorrow, I just wouldn't tell the difference. But, um, but really, I, I'm feeling as good as ever. And if I'm healthy, then you know you can't beat that. So, did you measure? You've tried a lot of diets. You said so. Did you did you measure? Like, did you take blood work every time you tried these diets? What if you kind of learned from yeah. all these diets? And how did you measure them? Yeah, I mean, I would always get blood labs done. I'm super curious about these things. Um, so I'd be measuring inflammatory markers, looking at things like CRP and sed rate and homocysteine and different things to see how, how do these diets objectively change my, my health. And, uh, for example, I had leaky gut, uh, once upon a time and I, I was, you know, still eating pretty healthy. Like you would, you would have thought that it was, it was a really healthy diet. And I remember thinking, okay, this is actually a little bit before the paleo diet became a thing. And I essentially did that. I was living in New York and I went to the farmer's market and got all my stuff grass fed and I, you know, I ate grass fed butter and kind of, uh, whatever I could get from, from as close to the earth as I could think. And my homocysteine levels were through the roof. Those are a marker of inflammation. It's a really important one to keep low. Otherwise you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and a bunch of other things that are really ugly. Mm. And so I remember, you know, that number dropped a point or two, but it was still about 20, which is crazy high. You want it to be close to zero. Um, and then switching over to the plant-based, it came down to really close to zero, if not zero for the last number of measures that I've had taken. So I like to track things like that in relation to the diet, uh, track my body composition. You know, when I worked in obesity research, I worked in obesity research for about five years. We had access to really fancy, fantastic body composition measuring tools like a DEXA and a bod pod. And so I've measured these things. So I love having before and after these experiments of one, I think are really fun to do. So I've done it here at True North too. I've played with a high fat vegan diet, a low fat vegan diet, um, low carb, high carb, low protein, high protein, all those things. So I just think it's fun to track these things, to track it off of my bench press or my squat, my sprint times, all that to me is just a really fun thing to, to look at. So I'll do that with each of these diets just to see, does any change happen? And to be honest with you, it's uh, really hasn't changed much. It's just more for objective markers of health. So you said you could you could lose weight, gain weight on any diet. So for you, you figured out how to lose weight, how to gain weight. But, you know, when it comes to just your blood work and everything else and feeling good and training the best, what what are some of the foods that have helped you comprise kind of the most optimal diet for you and that you've seen with your athletes that you train as well? Like what would breakfast, yeah, lunch, and um, dinner be? Yeah, so I, I do um, – I, I perform – 
uh, alternate day fasting. So this isn't something that I would recommend to my patients. This isn't something I would recommend to my clients necessarily. Um, it's just something that I personally find that I feel really, really good basically eating every other day. It's really, really hard to stick to. Compliance rates are very low in the literature, but that's personally how I, so I eat every other day. Yeah. When we met you, we thought that was crazy, but I I, I think it's also (laughs) interesting. I I mean, so I want to talk a little bit about fasting later, but, but when you do eat, what do you eat? When I do eat, uh, even when I, so I usually I'll still skip breakfast. I'm not a big breakfast guy, but I'll have, let's say, I don't know, I think lunch might be uh, lentil soup, a big salad and uh, a bowl of steamed veggies and sweet potato, for example. And no um, salt, maybe, right? What's that? Yeah, I don't, I don't add salt or oil uh, or sugar or any of it. It's just the food and herbs and spices. And then maybe I'd have a snack a little bit later. I actually like, I like oatmeal later in the day. I know people like to eat breakfast, uh, have oatmeal at breakfast. I like to throw oatmeal later, so I have oatmeal with some flax seeds, uh, some some nuts, a whole bunch of fruit cooked in with the oatmeal. I like that. Dinner might be like a stir fry with a bunch of quinoa, some beans in there too, and a ton of vegetables. So I do that kind of thing. And then I'll have like a treat every so often where, uh, I don't know, be like some date nut bar, not a whole lot of it, but once every week or two, I'll probably have something like that. If I was trying to lose weight, I wouldn't do that. If I was trying to gain weight, I'd probably have more of that. Um, But that's kind of a given day for me with a whole bunch of water and, you know, I'll take some B12 and call it a day. So it's pretty much... You know, no oil, no sugar, no salt, whole food, plant-based. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. And I wish that I learned that that was how it could be. I wish that I learned that that was the healthiest thing you could do when I was in school. I mean, if I had learned that like a decade ago, I could have saved so much time and so much trouble. Um, you know, we, we always talk and hear about moderation and all things in moderation. And that was one of the really eye-opening things to me about going to grad school and, and my journey since then and coming to True North is that really – you know, you eat moderately and you become moderately healthy, you become moderately athletic, uh, you become, I think, moderately happy. And I really like pushing it. And I really like seeing what's mm. the best performance I can get from my body, from my brain, what is optimal, what is, you know, and so that's one of the things that I feel like this diet feeds into. It's, it's you know, p- pushing the pedal to the metal. I love that. I think that you're right. If you do things moderately, you are moderate and you kind of take it to the extreme. And it is a wild idea to absolutely to eat every other day and skip entire days. It's probably socially a little challenging as well. Um, (laughs) You know, people freaked out when I told them, hey, I I fasted four days only with water. And I'm one of those people who I couldn't even skip lunch before I went to True North Health. I don't think I ever did. Like I didn't skip meals. But I found fasting on water only for four days really easy. And by day two, my skin started to repigment. It was crazy. I was like, this is, this is insane, but it really worked for me. So, you know, I haven't been able to explain this to friends. So maybe you can help me. What is fasting scientifically do to your body? What happens? Yeah, there's a bunch of things. Um, I would think of it like spring cleaning. You know, you give your chance, your body a chance to empty out all the garbage that it's accumulated that it would otherwise just continue to store. So you're experiencing profound catabolism. Catabolism just means tearing down of tissue Mm -hmm. during a fast, especially during an extended fast like what you experience. So when we tear down old, decrepit tissue, we're just left with the younger, fresher stuff. And then when you refeed, you can rebuild a brand new, you know, for example, immune system, but, but other systems as well that you know, need to, to be rebuilt in a more powerful way. So we see improvements in the body and tons of different things. You know, we see insulin sensitivity improve, you know, we see, uh, you know, basically brain function improve. Actually, that's one of the coolest things I think that happens when you fast is you become hungry and, uh, hunger hormones like ghrelin, for example, go up and that's trying to help you find food. It's basically training for your brain. So even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's uncomfortable to feel hungry, the same way it's uncomfortable to run, you know, your legs, if you didn't know that that soreness and burning that you feel in your legs when you run, if you didn't know that that was actually good for you, you might stop because you say, this is actually, this is bad. I'm afraid what's happening to my legs. If you don't know that that hunger sensation, that, that experience of hunger, if you didn't know that that was good for you, you might say, this is terrible. I need to stop fasting, but it actually makes us smarter, increases production of a, a protein called brain derived neurotrophic factor. Basically makes us smarter. It actually causes, uh, uh, new brain cells to develop from stem cells. It causes amazing, amazing things to happen in the brain. It kind of pushes us away from dementia. So, so many different amazing things happen in different parts of the body. A lot of people are afraid it's going to tear down my muscle fibers and I'm going to lose all this muscle. That doesn't happen. We know that growth hormone goes up 
during a fast, during a, a you know, like what I'm doing, these 24-hour, 36-hour mm-hmm. fasts, uh, and protects us against the loss of these. So we're not going to get skinny and weak. We're not going to do, none of that's going to happen. Um, just a really fantastic thing has happened all around. And there's lots of incredible new research coming out on how this can be applied to people with tons of different conditions, including, you know, things you wouldn't think might respond well to this, like multiple sclerosis, for example. Hmm. That's so interesting. You know, there's also this big trend towards intermittent fasting. And I guess what you do is maybe a form of intermittent fasting. But, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about, there's a lot of research about cell aptosis, which is, isn't that when cells mm-hmm. die after fast? And then they rebuild. Yeah, apoptosis. Apo- apoptosis. I'm saying it wrong. And then um, I had another question. Maybe you can talk about cell apoptosis. But then I was just reading Tools of Titan, which is Tim Ferriss's book. And, and he says, hey, you know, he does his form of fasting, um, which is not the way you you taught it at True North. You know, the water only fast. He uses all these ketones and other stuff. And then when he refeeds, he, he basically says like, hey, it doesn't really matter what you refeed with. Like... When you're a caveman, you know, you refed with whatever. You don't need to eat beets and carrots. But I think it would be really hard to just eat crap after you fast. Like, don't you want to <laughs> refeed with something really healthy and light on your stomach? I mean, why don't, I guess, what is the scientific reason why when you refeed after a fast, it should be, you know, fruit or something raw vegetable based and light? Well, I mean, you're, you're using that as the building block of whatever the new system is that you're building. So imagine that you were to tear down uh, pieces of the building that were falling apart. These decrepit pieces, they're now gone. Now, whatever you're eating, that's the first thing you're introducing to your body. Your body's going to incorporate that into the structure, the foundation of this building that you've, you know, just demolished pieces of. So it would be weird to me to fast, to go through this process, um, to sensitize my body to uh, really important proteins and, and signaling uh, factors. And, to then eat some garbage to throw that back into the body just seems like a weird thing to do. Like you kind of negated the benefit of the fast. So I think it's important. And also, you know, a caveman isn't going to go and eat McDonald's when they break their fast either. They're not going to have access to those sorts of things. I mean, I imagine when you break your fast, you, you know, whatever it is, let's say uh, berries are just starting to come into bloom. You don't have a whole lot of uh, energy. So you're not going to go and hunt a, a buffalo a <laughs> few days after a winter fast. So you, you probably end up going for things that are easier to get your hands on. Um, and it typically seems to be those things are, are pretty healthy to, to eat. That makes a lot of sense. You know, it's it's cool to see this big movement towards plant-based diets right now. I think there's a lot of mistakes people make when it comes to plant-based diets. And you said yourself, you were an unhealthy vegetarian. W- what are some of the common mm-hmm. mistakes people kind of make when it comes to trying to convert to a plant-based diet? And what are some of the mistakes you made when you said you were an unhealthy vegetarian? What would you eat that was not helpful? Uh, Sure. That's a great question. I mean, there are so many foods that are vegetarian or even vegan that are unhealthy, like Bisquick or Oreos. I mean, these are, these are (laughs) vegan foods, but they're processed garbage. So just because a food is, yeah. So just because a food is, uh, is vegetarian or vegan doesn't really mean a whole lot. You can still, can I, curse on your podcast it's okay you can curse a little cool. bit i was gonna say <laughs> i feel like a lot of those foods are like chemical shit storms you know you're basically just unleashing the fury of some nasty factory uh into your body and that doesn't make it healthy just because it doesn't have meat I, that's one mm. of my problems with the term vegan a vegan diet you're, you're just basically talking about what is excluded from the diet i like a plant-based diet because you're talking about what you're actually including you're eating plants so i think it's just as much a function of what you're not eating as what you are eating and when i was an unhealthy vegetarian. I mean, I was still taking like casein protein powder. I was still eating Oreos. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was eating fruit roll-ups and stuff that is still, it was still vegetarian, but just because it didn't have uh, meat, it didn't mean that it was healthy. You know, you can still pour oil all over your food and it doesn't make it healthy, even if it's olive oil or even if it's coconut oil or things that are controversial. And, you know, I, I, I think uh, it, it makes sense to focus on what you are eating rather than what you're not eating often. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I had eaten a lot of coconut oil. I would make sweet potato fries, put down coconut oil. I'd cut sweet potatoes up, put them down on coconut oil, and they'd become like sweet potato fries. And then when I went to True North Health, they said, you know, oil really isn't that great for you. Um, And so I started just using a piece of parchment paper, sliced sweet potatoes thin, I'll make and I'll make like nachos. I'll put like beans on it and salsa, and it's, it's pretty healthy. I probably eat that like once or twice a week. But why, why scientifically is oil kind of not something you recommend for optimal eating? 
Well, for a bunch of, I would look at oil as like the same kind of thing as juice. It's just pressed from a different plant. So you're basically just ripping out the fiber. You're ripping out some of the protein. You're ripping out a lot of the phytonutrients that are found in that food. And you're just concentrating the piece of it that's calorically dense. So if I was going to eat coconut, that would be different than coconut oil. Why would I rip out so many of the healthful components of that food, especially for a lot of people who are trying to lose weight? Like, why am I going to pull out those parts, the fiber and the protein are satiating? Um, and why would I ever want to rip out the, all the phytochemicals? So I guess I just see it as concentrating the one part that we probably don't need in a culture of excess and pulling out the stuff that we do need where we, you know, we end up with insufficient, you know, plant mm, yeah, chemicals that, that, that can help us out. That makes sense. So basically non-process is the best. It sounds like whole food. You know, a lot of people ask yeah. me like, how do you get your protein if you're vegan? And I feel like I'm stronger than ever, but it's really hard to explain it to people. And then they asked, do you take protein powder? I mean, I even have a really good girlfriend and she said, Hey Shelby, I'm on this new diet. I'm really trying to get 130 grams of protein a day. And I mean that to me, that seems really high and she's eating like, she's just going out of her way to force like all this meat and protein powder into her diet. I mean, what are your, what's your take on how you get protein on a plant-based diet? I mean, it's super, super easy. Like you, we look at the data on how much protein are these people are are, are plant based eaters getting, and without even trying, they're well over a hundred percent. I forgot exactly which amino acid it was that they had the least amount, but it was like one hundred nine percent of what they require in a given day. So without even focusing on the way that they eat, a plant based dieter is going to exceed their requirements. That's not to say that it's optimal for athletic performance. Uh, if you know if you were an endurance athlete, I think this type of diet would be fantastic. You, it would just play into it perfectly. That's why you see people, um, you know, you get like Rich Roll and uh, Brendan Brazier and lots of endurance athletes um, just naturally gravitate into this. And uh, if we were looking to maximally build muscle, like optimally build size, and I do that with a lot of patients or a lot of clients of mine, then we would just tailor it a little bit. You know, we would, we would add additional legumes to their diet. Maybe they'd have more chili or they'd have more split pea soup or they'd have more lentil soup or black beans or they'd have a hummus that we'd make without olive oil. Uh, but you know, maybe more tahini or, or even without that. So I would just have more greens and beans because those are going to have a higher percentage of calories coming from protein. So for the people who actually do need to, to add muscle mass to their frame, um, you know, like a, like a shot put or whatever it might be who, you know, performing competitively in this way, then we would up protein that way, but without even trying for the rest of us who are not in that 1% who are competing in that way, you know, we're not even gonna have to try and we're going to get it. We would actually have to go out of our way to become deficient in protein. I don't even know if you could do it in this country. Like you would have to try really hard. So the 130 gram requirement is, is not accurate then. I mean, for what purpose? Like 130 grams to do what? I don't know. I I, generally healthy. I'm guessing that's what she weighs. And the nutritionist that she's gone to has said, Hey, you need one gram of protein. One gram per pound. Per pound. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's just not based in anything scientific. I feel like to, to push that, I mean, the recommended daily allowance is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. The most I can see in the literature being warranted for strength athletes who are training really hard is basically doubling that 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And what, since one kilogram is 2.2 pounds, she's, her nutritionist has her well over that 1.6 up to 2.2. And there's actually data showing that that's not beneficial. Like doubling the RDA seems superior to tripling the RDA. Uh, for building muscle, for cutting fat. So I just, I think it's that one gram per pound. I don't, I know where the mythology came from. I just don't feel like it, it, I would like for it to die. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot of, there's a lot of new research coming out. I love what Rich Roll is doing and Brendan Brazier and, and, you know, even my friend Rhonda Patrick, she's not totally plant-based, but she has some really interesting studies that have come out about intermittent fasting. And, and it's, it's fascinating. You know, I just want to go back to this intermittent fasting because you you talked about how it helps your focus. There's a guy I met. He's he's a teacher at MIT and one of his research friends, he's an older guy. He's like been up for Pulitzer prizes. He eats every three days and it says, he says it Mm -hmm. helps him with his, his studies. It's so interesting. It's cool. It really is cool. You feel sharp. You think of a lot of people too. You think of like Henry David Thoreau and some of these real brainiac folks who go off on their own and this is where they have some of their best ideas and they're not stuff in their faces when they're so far away from civilization. So it's really amazing. You, you, I think it's worth trying. It's worth just seeing what happens if you skip a meal. I think 
you know, like you're saying, they, they, they feel sharpest when this is happening and your brain is just trying to help you find food. It's like, it can be anxiety producing, but if you realize this is actually just your body ramping up your, your cognitive, you know, your, your sharpness, your energy to help find that food, you can channel it into other things. You can sublimate it. And it's really amazing. It's just an amazing feeling. You feel alive. Do you ever crave like burgers or steak or meat still? <laughs> Because I, mean, I do. Do I crave those foods? Uh, yeah. I mean, every every yeah. now and then do you, you do. And so how do you, what do you do? Like for me, I, because I'm really trying hard to be plant-based only because I've seen what happened to having white splotches on my lips and I'm a little bit vain. Mm-hmm. I, I just eat greens and beans and it tends to go away like these weird cravings. And I feel mm-hmm. great. I did try some cool. fake chicken thing last night. I've never tried it, but someone offered it to me and it was... It was one of these brands that do like vegan chicken, fake chicken, and it was terrible. I felt so yeah. terrible afterwards. Um, <laughs> anyways, greens and beans. Is that your cure, greens and beans? Or like what do you do when you just – I like them, greens and beans. And honestly, I don't I – don't, I mean in terms of the cravings, I think of it psychologically. Like I think why am I getting this craving? Is it because I just walked past? Uh, you know, like a burger joint that I used to go to? Is it because I'm stressed? And I feel like – it's, it's never, it's not your body saying you are iron deficient. You need to have this meat. To, it's not that. I think a lot of people think that your body is calling to you in some important way. Cause you notice you, you, you people have cravings for things that are really energy dense that are going to be really, I, I don't know, just things that are more addictive. I think of it in an addictive way and the same way that I don't know, I guess I just, I know what it does to my body and I know that that experience of being in an, addi- in an addictive cycle, just, it's stressful. Yeah. It, you know, if I have a craving, it's not like a good experience. If I end up eating the thing that I didn't want to eat, it's not like it was something that gave me pleasure. It's just so that I could stop thinking about it. And then I feel like that just drives the cycle. Yeah. And that's what I like about some of the founders here, one of them, or both of them, I guess. They, they wrote a book called The Pleasure Trap. And when I've strayed from this way of eating, it's not for joy. It's just so that I can stop stressing about, you know, if I go to a party and there's brownies and I end up eating a brownie, it's not because I'm so excited about eating a brownie. It's just because I don't want to have to keep fighting myself on that. So I I don't really like to feed into that. I try to break that cycle and put distance between me and the last chicken wing. And over time, like it is with an alcoholic, it's never like it goes away, but you stop craving it to the same extent. It's always there someplace. So you said, you know, do you ever crave like whatever ribs or whatever? Sure. But um, the more time I put in between myself and that last time I did it, the easier it becomes. I have so many more questions when it comes to nutrition. Like, I just want to ask you, do you do coffee? Do you ever use stevia? Do you use protein powder? No, none of them. None of them. No, for different reasons for each of them. But, you know, again, just speaking back to that pleasure trap, um, the, the stevia, if I have stevia, then strawberries don't taste that sweet because I've just changed the threshold of what I require for something to taste sweet. So if I fast for a day and then I eat a carrot, man, that carrot is crazy sweet to me. Like if I haven't eaten in 36 hours and then I have a carrot, it's just unbelievable. But if I had stevia, then all of a sudden that carrot doesn't taste so good. Like right now, I mean, I don't add salt to my diet and I'm still getting plenty of sodium. Like I'm not going to die of hyponatremia. But if I eat chard, chard tastes so salty to me now. It's unbelievable. But if I was to add, even if it was like a totally benign salt replacer to my diet. It would still change my threshold. So now I felt like I needed it. That's another piece that goes into this is I like to live in a way where I, I require the least amount that I, you know, that I need to, to be happy and to be healthy. And so if I now have an umbilical cord to some artificial sweetener, or even if it's a natural, one, even if it's steady, even if it's erythritol, whatever it might be, now I need that to be happy. And I think about that with my training. You know, I think of it like, do I really, do I need to have a gym to be happy and to be healthy? Can I climb trees? Can I play in monkey bars? Can I do sprints in the grass? Like what's the least amount that I need? And I think, you know, I think of people like I love my brother like crazy. He needs like eight cups of coffee a day, every like hour or two. If he's not having coffee, he's miserable. So he has an umbilical cord. He can't basically leave Manhattan. You know, if he was to come to some place where there's not a Starbucks in every corner, it just kind of snares him. And so I, uh, I don't want that on a personal level. And so I try to keep just the stuff that I need. Mm. So yeah, freedom is, is huge. Freedom from, from just having anything. I have a friend who just doesn't drink coffee and I was like, why is it? Cause I just don't want to be like, I don't want to have to go surfing and stop to get coffee before I go surfing. 
Um, I'm not yeah. there yet, but I, I applaud people like that. <laughs> you know, when it comes to training, you just talked a little bit about it, but can you tell us a little bit about your unique approaches to training and, and also not only for you, but what you, what you do with other people? Sure. So what I do personally is, is honestly pretty different than what I do with, with others. Um, I like to lower the barriers for entry for other people to be able to train. So a lot of people feel weird about going to a gym. I tell them they don't need to go to a gym. There's a whole lot of stuff they can do at home or at a park. There's a whole lot you can do with a suspension trainer in your own doorway or even without it. So I think the most important thing is just that people do something that they enjoy. You know, if you hate squatting, then don't squat. If you hate bench pressing, don't bench press. If you love walking on your hands, then you can walk on your hands. If you like, you know, like I said before, climbing trees, you could do that too. So I've done a bunch of different things to be fit. And they go from heavily tracking my numbers and doing really intensely periodized training programs to just getting out and playing. And I think it's worth noting that the cultures where the people live the longest, they're not doing any formal exercise. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're really active throughout the day, but there's nothing really formal about it. So for athletes that I work with, I mean, I'm obviously having them lift and they're doing very specific movements on very specific days and reps and sets and everything, training volume we're accounting for. Um, I did that for years. And at a certain point, I just thought, man, like, I'm not trying to be a competitive athlete. I want to go outside and, and just spend more time outside. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll go outside barefoot. I'm not telling other people to do this. I, you know, I've, I've taken a lot of time to build up the muscles underneath my feet, my arches, my plantar fascia, all of that is strong and capable now. So I'm not telling other people who have thought I should take them off and now do the same thing. Definitely don't do that. But I'll personally, I'll go outside and I'll lift barefoot. I'll go jog over to the park. That's about a three quarters of a mile or a mile away. Um, and I'll, I'll do some wind sprints barefoot. I'll climb trees. I will, there's a big rock that I'll pick up and I'll throw. I'll do, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things that just feel like fun. There's a jungle gym there. I like to climb over the jungle gym as fast as I can come back as fast as I can do some things like that for work capacity and also mobility. I'll go under things, you know, that look like hurdles, for example. So I like to be outside and active in my environment. I feel more alive there than I do in a gym, but, um, I used to feel alive in a gym. So I think whatever is fun for people to do is, is really worth doing. Again, unless you're really in a competitive environment, in which case, you know, there are some specific things you'd have to do. What about hot, cold training? You know, there's like this Wim Hof stuff and then there's saunas, there's ice training. Do you do any of that? Uh, yeah, I just do it naturally because when it's cold out, I don't layer up more. And I mean, I, I live in California, I live in Northern California. So obviously if someone's in Alaska, it's going to be different, but I wear the least amount of clothing that I can in order to not be distracted by my core temperature. So, uh, <laughs> You know, if it's warm out, wow. I'll be shirtless. And if it's cold out, I'll be shirtless. And I would sooner wear gloves to protect the extremities, for example, than, than I would wear like a vest or something, you know, a short sleeve shirt, which seems weird to me because it's keeping the inside warm, but the stuff that would get frostbite would be the outside. So anyway, I do that stuff, but I don't go out of my way to do it. I don't do contrast showers. Um, when I go to sleep, I just wear the least amount of sheets or covers or whatever it is that I can do to, to feel comfortable. And I recommend the same thing to, to my patients. It's just, you don't have to be extreme about it. You just, if you could go outside in a t-shirt or in long sleeve shirt and either way you're, you're fine. You know, you're, you maybe you're a little bit chilly with the t-shirt, but it's not anything noticeable. I say, just do that, you know, do whatever, just make it unnoticeable. And then you progressively overload. You slowly build that brown fat around your uh, central nervous system and you'll, you'll develop that. You'll actually train it like a muscle. It'll get stronger. I remember you told me you kind of, we baby ourselves and the more discomfort we can do from training, sometimes the better. Yeah. I, I, with everything. I think it's like that with, I think that like, you know, with fasting, it's the same thing. I think with school too, you know, if you can't delay gratification, you can't get a degree, you can't learn cool things. So you kind of have to put off playing with your friends in the park for right now so that you can learn things. So I think delaying gratification and, and being willing to feel uncomfortable is really what, what, forges forges the strongest people and so yeah whether it's fasting whether it's you know it could be could could play into anything could play into food could play into but I, I definitely think that that's what makes us stronger is to be able to to endure and then to adapt that whole concept of hormesis is we we learn to now be stronger based off of some of the hardships we experience and if we start to learn if we if we can look at the hardships as actually enjoyable that this is actually what's making us stronger then it doesn't even feel difficult and training actually feels fun because you see the purpose that it's serving so do you want to tell us about that one time in New York City when you walked around barefoot? <laughs> yeah, we uh I'm happy to share this. So I, I don't I don't recommend this to anyone else. <laughs> I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I want to put that out there because I, I you know I work at a water fasting facility and we do it. It's medically supervised and I'm an idiot. And so just take 
into consideration that I'm not, I'm doing, I'm saying do as I say, not as I do. So I water fast, even when I'm not under medical supervision, I have no preexisting conditions. There's no contraindication to doing it. So I do it. And I like to do it when I'm on vacation. Uh, it just takes a lot of, you know, I don't have to go and cook and whatever. Oh, so anyway, awesome. Yeah. You don't have to worry uh, about it. When I went back to New York. Yeah. It's much easier for me and I feel much more calm. I, I use vacations as a way to relax. So, uh, so yeah, I went back to New York this last winter and I, I told you I'm a weird guy and I, I walk around barefoot and it was, it was New York and it was cold and I cold stress too. So I was near nude walking, <laughs> walking down the street to go pick up my friend from the train station. I was on my uh, 10th day of a water fast. Again, I'm not recommending anyone do that. And I was going to get my friend and a cop car came over and it, it they stopped me and they said, Hey, are, are you okay? We got two phone calls. Uh, people were concerned that there was a guy who was wearing no shoes, uh, walking in the cold. And are you okay? And they were actually really nice about it. They were, it was, they weren't like, you know, antagonistic or anything. And I said, no, I'm totally fine. I'm, I'm, I'm an exercise physiologist. So I, I'm really well aware of the way that the foot works. And, and so it's actually pretty amazing. And I said, you know, if I wear shoes, it kind of changes this. And I bent down to show and I said, Hey, look, take a look at the, the arch in my foot. And it's this beautiful spring and it's designed to work in this way. And I think they were looking at me like, this guy's crazy. Like, why? you know, he's talking about his foot. Um, and then when I stood back up to continue talking with them, I got a little bit lightheaded because I was on my 10th day of fasting. And they looked like, they looked at me like, I, I guess it looked like I was going to pass out. Um, I didn't feel like I was going to, but I guess I got a little woozy for a second. And they said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm just on my, on my 10th day of a, of a water fast. So it's, it's cool. And uh, <laughs> I just saw them look at each other like, what on earth? Like, what? who is this guy? Like, what is this? What are you doing? And um, I, I thought it was totally normal. And I realized like, no, I, I guess I guess I've strayed from the norm <laughs> a good amount here. And it, it was reflected in these guys' faces. So Interesting. I love it. What were you like as a kid, David? Actually, two questions. <laughs> what were you like as a kid? And if you could go back, what advice would you give to your 15-year-old self? Oh, my goodness. That's an totally unexpected question, but I'll, I'll take it. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm chatty, right? Like, yes. You hear me talk. I love it. Uh, I'm actually an introvert. I know that sounds like a lot of people are surprised, but I, I really am an introvert. And when I was 15, I was introverted. And the way I look at introversion or extroversion is just where do you get your energy from? You know, do you, do you thrive? Do you feel most alive when you're in a group of people or when you're by yourself? Mm. And I spend all my time with people like all day long and I'm working with people and I'm giving lectures. And, and so that, that can tax me. And when I was a kid, I thought that that was wrong. I thought it was bad. I thought I had to, to kind of turn, I, I, I taught myself to learn to be socially competent because I think I was kind of shy and I thought that that wasn't cool. And my, my, my family, like my friends, I think everyone, we all, I think everyone seemed like they would have been happier if I was able to, to be, more conversational. So I wish I could go back in time and say, Hey dude, it's totally cool. Like you can, you don't, you know, if you feel, if you don't want to go to a party tonight and you just want to go and take a walk by yourself, like that's totally fine. You don't have to force yourself to go out and you can just be at peace with yourself. I always feel most alive. Like if I were to go to a party, I would rather go up to the mezzanine and look down and kind of watch what's actually happening. That's I'd rather observe than participate in some of these ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, I wish I gave myself license to do that, I guess. It's mm, good advice. What's your favorite thing, I guess, yeah. to, to make, to eat, or to take to a party? Oh, what's my favorite thing? I think everyone likes sushi. Like, not, not fish sushi, um, but, like, <laughs> homemade too. sushi is, isn't... Is yeah, yeah, even, uh, yeah, even vegan sushi. Really, really, I think people love sushi. It's just, like, a fun finger food, and it's hard to make, but if you know how to do it, it's... Uh, Everyone likes it. So I thought you were a big hummus guy too. Uh, I like hummus. I do. I mean, not the olive oil based kind, but there's um, one of our uh, our kitchen manager here is named Mauricio, and he makes a, a stellar balsamic vinegar hummus. I know it sounds weird, balsamic vinegar and hummus, but it's crazy good. And then there's a cookbook here, or actually a website, uh, Straight Up Food. They make a hummus too. There's a bunch of different hummuses that I like. I really, really do like hummus. Um, but again, when you pull the fat out, it's just a different experience. Yep. But, uh, but I really like that. And that's a totally good thing to do. Celery sticks or carrots or whatever. So if people want to get more into like plant-based eating and, and some of these training modalities, are there any books or websites you recommend that we could point people to? 
Mm. Some of the training stuff. I mean, I, I love some of the big strength and conditioning coaches that isn't going to blow anyone's mind, but names like Eric Cressy, you know, he's a smart, smart man. And Mike Boyle, those are really smart strength and conditioning coach. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them that I really respect. Kelly Sturrett, who wrote a book called Becoming a Supple Leopard. He has brilliant ways of explaining um, how to mobilize. Uh, I like the MoveNet website and the certification. They're basically teaching how to how to use your body in nature the way it was intended to be used. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff in that regard. I think for diet, I, you know, I put together a lecture on sports nutrition that I'm going to hope to get out onto YouTube fairly soon to get people started. There's Joel Furman published an article called something like fueling the vegetarian or vegan athlete. I don't remember exactly which one it was, but he published that in peer reviewed literature. And that's a cool article to show people to get started. So there's a bunch of different resources out there, but I definitely want to put my own stuff out and it'll just take a little bit of time. Awesome. I love having you on the show, David. You're so interesting. You know, if you could, if you could fly an eco-friendly plane over the sky and have it read a billboard (laughs) to the world, is there, is there a message to the world that you would write on it? Oh man, you're putting me on the spot there, aren't you? I know. I should have given you this Uh, ahead of time. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's cool. That's cool. I don't know. Something, something, I'm I'm not going to be really articulate, but something like take a break. Like, I feel like when we're always in a grind and we're, we don't stop to take a moment in between what we do, take a break, like take a sick day, you know, even pretend like you're actually sick. And so all your friends and family, everyone actually thinks that you're sick and take a little bit of time to reflect. So maybe it would just say reflect, like take a break and reflect Mm. something like that. I love that message. I, I like taking sick days. Usually I go surfing. Um, David, <laughs> I love having you on. Where can people find out more? I'm going to definitely put the links to that YouTube video and all of the books you've talked about in the show notes. But is there a place people can find you? Facebook, Instagram, where, where do you spend your time, I guess, socially? Yeah. You know, I actually, I'm not going to lie. I don't spend a lot of time in that whole world. You're welcome <laughs> to make me your Facebook friend. Like I'm totally cool to be your Facebook friend. We can pretend like we're, we're buddies. You can see like my pictures of me with my family and stuff. Once in a while I post an article that I think is interesting. I mean, you can find, I guess, facebook.com slash David Michael Goldman. I don't know if I have a, if I get too many friends. Well, I don't have that many friends. So well, I'll good. tell you what, we're um, going to so yeah. post articles though, that you've written and I'll link back to things that you've participated in as well as your YouTube videos. And I guess other than that, cool. we'll have to wait. And also we- check out True North's website, check oh, out True North right. or health, uh, healthpromoting.com or True North Um, I mean, that's where I work and it's a pretty amazing place. I think there's a lot of good resources to, to see over there. There's a great article of a, a GQ writer who spent some time at True North health. And he basically talks about like how it was horrible and, then he goes, and then at the end, he's like a total convert. It's a great, it's a great story. Well, David, thanks so much. Yeah, for, he's actually been back here. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I know he's been doing some more research there and doing some great work. You have a lot of people that come through there, NASA scientists, all sorts of people. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, really fun, diverse crowd. Actually, I do want to ask you one question. You know, what are some of the biggest case studies that kind of have come through there that have been cured through fasting and diet? Um, I'd say the most recent and really cool case report was published in the British Medical Journal, and it was on lymphoma. It was, yeah, I mean, you could just Google True North Lymphoma British Medical Journal, and it will it will come up, and pretty cool stuff. I mean, we can't say that we cured it or anything like that, but it was just a fantastic improvement uh, from someone who came here and water fasted, so... That's definitely a good resource to direct people to. Has there been anything else? I know you'd said something about hypothyroidism. There was a girl with a really chronic headache. Yeah, that's where actually that was, um, that's near publication, the chronic persistent headache, um, 16 year headache that, uh, resolved. Um, I'm in the midst right now of, uh, writing up a report on, uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. And we're working on two other ones, one with a prolactinoma and one with lupus. So there's a whole bunch that are in the works right now. Another condition called glossitis, which is inflammation of the tongue. So there's a whole bunch of really amazing um, improvements that seem to happen. People come here. And so we're just getting that out in the peer reviewed literature now. We're just churning it out. So more to come. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much. I'm sure there's going to be questions. So if you have questions, you can email me, Shelby at wildideasworthliving.com and I'll get them over to David and, and get back to you. David, thanks so much for coming on. Good luck on the movie. And My uh, we can't wait to see more of you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Shelby. I appreciate it. 
Thank you for listening to this show. I hope you got something out of it. I'm going to put links as much as possible for the things David and I spoke about on the show notes. Just go to wildideasworthliving.com, click on David's show, and there will be a list of links, including a really funny article by a GQ writer called How a Terrible Insufferable Six-Day Water Fast Made Me a New Man. I thought it was hilarious because I related to it when I tried a four-day water-only fast under supervised doctors. So check it out. The books are all linked to an Amazon account. So when you click on those books and buy from there, it definitely helps the show out because we get a little bit of a commission and this is a labor of love, but I'm loving it. And thank you for all the feedback, for the comments and for telling your friends. This show has grown exponentially every week. We couldn't do it without you. I really appreciate the support. So thanks again for listening. We have some great guests coming up, including rock climber, Chris Sharma. So stay tuned until next week. And wherever you are, remember, the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas. 